Before I joined the computer science department in Cambridge, I used to work in a startup in Silicon Valley. Now, after I had been offered the post at Cambridge, I got a call asking if I'd be willing to teach the first year algorithms course, and I said yes. Then I started looking through the syllabus and I came to Fibonacci heaps. So I asked around the software engineers in the startup, do you know about Fibonacci heaps? Now, we had really good engineers. All the VCs said that we had a particularly talented team by the standards of Silicon Valley startups. And when I asked these engineers about Fibonacci heaps, their eyes went wide in a sort of panicked stare like a rabbit in headlights. And they said, um, um, isn't that like a super advanced algorithm? And I said, it's what Cambridge students learn in their first year. So that's the topic of this video, the Fibonacci heap or how to implement an exceedingly clever priority queue. To understand where it comes from, here's a reminder about the three different implementations of the priority queue that we saw in the last video and the worst case running time complexity. And let me highlight some of the lessons to draw from these different implementations. First lesson, be lazy. If you want to be really fast, you don't have time to go around keeping your data structure pristine all the time. You have to be able to just dump stuff around the place like the linked list implementation does. But you can't be completely disorganized. You have to impose some structure. Otherwise, you pay the price of having a very slow pop min. So next lesson. You have to do cleanup sometimes. And when you do do cleanup, do it in batches. I've highlighted here the big O log n complexity of push for a binary heap because of an interesting fact that you may remember from earlier in the course. The worst case cost of a single push is O of log n. So the worst case cost of n pushes is O of n log n. But if you batch together all of these n new items and push them in one go, you can do it in O of n. So the lesson is when you do do cleanup, see if you can find ways to get efficiency savings by doing your cleanup in batches. The third lesson is the most subtle. In the binomial heap, we kept the data in a nice binomial structure, something that looks a little bit like binary digits. And pushing a new item was like adding one in binary. And this meant that most of the pushes that we made only had to touch a very small part of the data structure. And this let them be O of 1 amortized. If you think very deeply about the magic that made this work, it ends up, I'd say, being a sort of synthesis of the first two lessons. But to see that takes some very deep thinking, and I'm going to leave it for you to make your own sense of it. I'm in this video, I'm going to dive straight into the Fibonacci heap and explain how it works. This is what a Fibonacci heap looks like. It looks like the binomial heap. It's a list of trees, each one of them a heap. Unlike the binomial heap, the trees are allowed to have any shape at all. They're not restricted to being binomial trees. Also, we're going to keep a pointer to the tree with the smallest root which must be the smallest item in the entire data structure thanks to the heap property. We'll do this because we want fast access to it and because the number of trees might be very large. And so let's see how it works. Let's start with the push operation. Push is really simple. We just bung in our new item. We bung it in as a tree with just one node and that's all there is. Oh, except for the min root pointer, which we should update if we need to bung in another new item, we just stick it in, no more thought needed. This is all just like the silly linked list priority queue that we looked at in the last video. It's the simplest, laziest thing we can think of, and it's clearly O of 1. Let's just write out the code for it. There's nothing interesting in this code snippet here, except to say this is what the Fibonacci heap needs to store. It stores a list of pointers to the root node of each of the heaps and it stores a pointer to the smallest of the root nodes. Okay, so push is trivial. Next, let's look at pop min. Pop min is actually just the same as it was for the binomial heap. 
First, we extract the smallest item from the heap. This is the one that Minroot is pointing to. This leaves us with some orphaned child nodes, which we will promote to the root list. And next, we do cleanup, the same sort of cleanup that we did for the binomial heap. We're going to repeatedly merge trees whose roots have equal degree, and we'll keep on doing this over and over again until there are no more left to merge. Here, for example, we could start out by taking the seven and the three, both of them degree zero, and we merge them. We'll put the three on top and the seven underneath so that the heap property is preserved. And now we look again and ask, are there any roots with equal degree? Yes, there are. These two trees have roots of degree one, so let's merge them. And as usual, we do the merging so that the heap property is preserved. We make the larger root a child of the smaller root. Still not done. There are still two trees whose roots have the same degree. So we merge them and now we are done. The algorithm doesn't specify what order we do the merging in. I've just done it here, going through all the trees left to right, but it's an arbitrary choice. Finally, last step, we scan through all the trees we've ended up with and we set the min root pointer M to point to the smallest root node. Okay, so that's pop min, basically just the same as pop min in the binomial heap. The only difference is that this time in the cleanup phase, we're not just cleaning up the orphaned nodes, we're also cleaning up all the nodes that we pushed into the queue. That's the whole thing about getting efficiency savings by doing lots of cleanup in a batch. Okay, last operation to look at is decrease key, and this is where all the cleverness comes in. If you think back to that table we looked at at the beginning of this video, the table with the complexities of each of the operations, the only place where there was a difference between binomial heap and Fibonacci heap is in decrease key. Here's how it works. Let's suppose we want to decrease this item's key, say from five down to three. This is perfectly fine. Three is still larger than its parent, so the heap property still holds, so we don't need to do anything more. Okay, so let's consider the harder case. Let's decrease this some more. Let's decrease it down to zero. Now, there is a problem. There's a heap violation and we need to do something. For the binomial heap, our answer was bubble up the violating node. Bubble it up as far up as it needs to go. We're going to do something different. We're going to take a lesson from the silly linked list implementation of the priority queue, and we're going to be completely and utterly lazy. We're going to just slice this node out from its parent, and we're going to dump it into the root list. Now, the linked list was too silly. It just kept everything in a list with no structure at all, and that turned out to be no good. Here, we are just dumping stuff into the root list, true. But every now and then, whenever there's a pop min, we will do a cleanup. We'll tidy up the entire root list and we'll put it back into shape. And this approach of be lazy, let mess build up so that we can do a whole lot of cleanup in a batch and get efficiency savings. This is the spirit of clever amortized algorithm design. But there's a problem. The problem isn't having lots of nodes just dumped into the root list because we know that we can heapify a batch of things efficiently. The problem is that if we do too much of this lazy dump heap violating nodes into the root, then we might end up with this sort of wide and shallow tree, and this sort of tree turns out to be a problem. Now this here, this is the real genius of the Fibonacci heap design, realizing that wide shallow trees will cause a problem and finding a way to deal with it. In this video, all I'm going to describe is the procedure and the question of why it turns out to be exactly the right thing to do, that will become clear in the next video. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. Every time a node loses a child, we will mark that node as a loser. And if you lose two children, you get kicked out of the tree yourself. Let's walk through an example. Let's suppose we take this node, the seven, and we decrease its key down to one. 
then it's now a heap violator. And so to restore the heap, we'll cook it out of the tree and dump it into the root list. But this node 2, which was already marked as a loser, has now just lost a second child, so it's a double loser. And so its parent disowns it and it's kicked into the root list. We're also going to make it so that everything in the root list is marked as a non-loser. And that's why when 2 got kicked into the root list, its flag was wiped clean. And that's why 1 has not been marked as a loser. OK, so that's the Fibonacci heap. Let's go through a more complicated example. Here's an example with multiple loser ancestors. What I'd like you to do is work through the logic of what happens when we decrease the key of this bottom node, decrease it enough to cause a heap violation. It's really helpful to go through a sample run of an algorithm yourself rather than just watching. Please pause the video, work through the logic, and then when you're ready, press play. First step, the node whose key we just decreased is now a heap violator. So to restore the heap, we're going to dump it into the root list. Now we have a double loser, this node eight. So its parent disowns it and it gets kicked into the root list and its loser mark is wiped clean. But now the node five is a double loser so it too gets disowned by its parent. And the parent node, the four, gets marked as a loser. It's worth just reiterating the general rule. Nodes in the root list are always marked as non-losers. When we go through this decrease key operation, or when we call pop min and extract the min root and then promote its children, any node in the root list will get its loser mark wiped clean. Now, this is a whole lot of very finicky rules, and the full point of them won't be clear until we get on to do the amortized complexity analysis in the next video. The big things you need to remember about the Fibonacci heap are these. One, it's a sort of Frankenstein heap. It's a hybrid of the binomial heap and the silly linked list implementation. Two, sometimes it pays to let mess build up because you can get efficiency savings when you do cleanup in batches. And three, your parents want lots of grandchildren and they'll mark you as a loser and then they'll disown you if you don't have enough. As I said, the real genius of the Fibonacci heap, the absolutely precise and wonderful way that all these things are balanced together, that only really becomes clear in the amortized complexity analysis, which is the topic of the next video. But I want to finish off this video with just a few remarks about implementing the Fibonacci heap. This will just be about software engineering and about good coding style. It's not about algorithms per se, and so this section of the video will not be examinable. Every year that I've taught this course, students have invariably asked, how could decrease key possibly be O of log n? Doesn't it take time O of n to even find the node whose key we want to decrease? This is what students are thinking of. They have in mind Dijkstra's algorithm, the algorithm for finding distances on a graph, and this is what the algorithm does. It calls pop min to get the next vertex to explore, let's call it v, and then it scans through v's neighbors in the graph and potentially it finds a neighbor, call it W, whose key it wants to decrease. Let's think about this decrease key operation. We have a graph vertex W, and this W must be located somewhere inside the Fibonacci heap. Now, inside the Fibonacci heap, every node of the heap is connected to other nodes, and when we decrease the key, we may potentially have to relink some of those connections. If we think of this node in the Fibonacci heap as an object with a member variable for its payload, then we are indeed in trouble. If all I know is the payload W, and if I want to find the Fibonacci heap node that stores W, then yes, I do have to trawl through all the nodes in the Fibonacci heap to find it, and this is O of n. 
but this is the wrong way to think about it. Stepping back, each vertex is doing double duty. Each vertex is simultaneously in two separate sets of relationships. It's at once both a vertex in a graph with graph neighbours, and it's also a node in a Fibonacci heap with parent and children. And there's no reason why one view should take precedence over the other view. There's no reason to say each node object contains a vertex object, rather than saying it the other way around. Each vertex object contains a node object. And once we realize this, it opens our eyes to other ways to implement it. Here's how I'd implement it. I'd give each of my vertices an identifier of some sort. In most graph problems, there will be some sort of natural identifier that we can use. And then I'll just set up two dictionaries, i.e. two hash maps. One telling me the vertex object for each identifier, the other telling me the node object for each identifier. This way, I keep my two structures totally decoupled. And it's easy to say, for example, decrease the key associated with the vertex whose identifier is B. Alternatively, if you don't like dictionaries and you're an object fetishist, here's another design you could use. This design makes quite tricky use of generics and interfaces. It has two basic classes, the vertex class and the node class, and the vertex class uses a node. In other words, each vertex object has a member variable that's a node. Now, the Fibonacci heap is storing a collection of vertices, but we don't want our Fibonacci heap implementation to have to know anything about the vertex class. So instead, we're going to design it using generics. We'll say that the Fibonacci heap is made up of things of some generic type T. When you call pop min, you get back a T. When you push a value, you push something of type T and so on. Now for the clever bit. The Fibonacci heap needs each T object to have some storage in it for storing the parent pointer and the children pointers. And it does, does it by saying, each T object must provide the storage that I need and I shall get it by calling get fib node. So all that a vertex has to do is provide a get fib node method, and then it can be used as the generic T for the Fibonacci heap. And this way, the heap doesn't need to know anything at all about T other than that it provides get fib node. Okay, this is actually a little bit tangled. Personally, this feels a little bit too much like artificial puzzle solving to me, and so I prefer the implementation with two dictionaries.